What is energy? It's a concept that's at once easy and hard. It's easy because we encounter it every day in our life. We can perceive it. What I mean by that is if I'm at a reference point at a, at a stopped position and a car comes by me uh, with a certain velocity, then I say, oh, that car relative to me going at, a, at some speed, at a velocity, it has energy. It has kinetic energy. I perceive that. I feel it. It's intuitive, uh, whether it's today's world with moving vehicles or yesterday's world with uh, moving weapons and spears and swords. Uh, there is kinetic energy, um, movement. We're familiar with that. We can feel it. We can perceive it in our human experience. Uh, let's remember that thermodynamics is grounded in human experience. Back to what, you know, why did I choose the weapons analogy? Well, I was trying to go a little historical. Let's go back even farther to the, the, the cave person uh, with, uh, with um, stones. Um, this is something we can touch and feel. Movement, velocity, relative to us at a standstill. Um, we say, oh, that's a mass moving with a velocity. Kinetic energy. In a quantitative look, E is for energy. If we focus on the energy of uh, movement, kinetic energy, then we can talk about the energy Ke, the kinetic energy, and it turns out that kinetic energy depends on mass of the object, m, in uh, kilograms, and velocity of the object, or its speed, in meters per second, and the governing equation, energy, kinetic energy, is one-half mv squared. Uh, if you do that out, you find out the uh, energy is in joules as the unit. So that's good because energy should be in uh, joules. So to take an example, if we have a car, we have a car of a thousand kilograms moving at a hundred meters per second, then it's kinetic energy, that's 100 meters relative to uh, the observer, us, in a stationary location, zero meters per second. So there's a velocity differential, zero for us, 100, uh, the differential is 100. So moving at 100 meters per second, one half the mass, which is in kilograms, and the speed, 100 squared. So doing out uh, the math on that, we get uh, 10 to the 4 times 10 to the 3, so that's 10 to the 7. Uh, and we take one half of 10 to the 7, so 0 0.5, 10 to the 7 joules, or in short form, 5 times 10 to the 6 joules, or just 5 megajoules for that kinetic energy of that moving car. Where else do we perceive energy in our day-to-day -day lives? Well, if something is high, we know relative to us. Uh, higher than us. We know it can fall. We know that there's gravitational energy, whether that is the uh, the, the coconut uh, in uh, the hit show Gilligan's Island that falls from the tree and hits Gilligan on the head. Um, uh, that was uh, a gravitational energy at a higher height than Gilligan or something more modern like a hydroelectric power plant where there is a dam that keeps water at a, a high height and when that water comes rushing down to a lower height, um, uh, a turbine uh, goes around and electricity is generated. So gravitational energy, we know that's another form of uh, energy that we can feel, that we can touch. Another form of energy that's a bit more uh, modern, uh, the cave person uh, didn't uh, know about it, didn't feel it, didn't experience it, but it's just as uh, important and even more important in the, in, in the modern days is electricity and energy and storage. So uh, a historical example might be separating charge across two metal plates um, and, the, uh, and it takes uh, energy to separate that charge. And then if you connect those metal plates, an electric current can go between them. Um, right in your hand, most likely or nearby you, is another example of charge separated at a voltage, uh, which is a battery. That's another way we know that uh, that has energy. We can do something useful with it. Um, we'll talk a bit about work, what that word means in a technical sense in thermodynamics. But the word energy actually comes from the Greek, where N is in or inside, and erg is uh, 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 
uh, work. So it means that there's energy. Energy means there's work within. You can do something useful with it. We'll come to that when we talk about work interactions. Um, but for now, we can perceive that these various things in our lives, batteries, um, water at a higher elevation than us, a moving vehicle uh, 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 relative to us, moving fast relative to us, all of those are different types of energy, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, electric energy. In fact, if you've done rowing uh, and are a, a sports individual, then you know there's something called an erg that the sports individual practicing rowing pulls on and pulls on and pulls on. It's an erg. It's work. Um, there's a, a, the historical unit of, of, of uh, energy. Uh, there is one called an erg. Nowadays, we use something called a joule, but uh, there's a, a, an erg as a unit of energy. Um, energy. Let's take a look at gravitational potential energy. So for energy of gravitation, gravitational potential energy, it's called potential because um, you don't quite perceive it. If there's a coconut above you and it's not falling, you don't quite perceive it, but it can fall, so potential. Or if there's water at the top of a dam, but water is not flowing, you don't quite perceive it, but if it starts to flow, then you perceive it. So we have this word potential. Um, okay, so gravitational potential energy, governing equation for that is the mass of the object at some altitude relative to you, the observer, gravitational uh, acceleration, which has a fixed value on the planet Earth uh, to several, to about three decimal points, and the height uh, uh, that the object is at. So let's consider um, a, a cubic meter of water at 100 meters on Earth. Okay, so hydro hydropower example. In this case, the gravitational potential energy should be the mass of that cubic meter of water. Well, a cubic meter of water, I happen to know, is a thousand uh, kilograms at uh, standard uh, density. Gravitational acceleration uh, on Earth at most locations, a little variation on the farther decimal points, but 9.81. Uh, meters per second squared, and we're looking at 100 uh, meters. So if we do out the math on that, we get 9.81, 10 to the 5. All those units turn into joules, if you work that out. And so that's approximately one megajoule of gravitational potential energy that this cubic meter of water at 100 meters, um, so if it fell to zero meters, uh, the, the height of the observer, and those one megajoules could be transferred to another purpose, for example, a turbine and onto electricity. Another type of energy is internal energy. Um, it's a bit harder to put our finger on it, but something that is hot relative to us um, has more internal energy in it um, than something that is cold relative to us. In fact, applying fire to an object increases its temperature. How much uh, fire increases its temperature, a proportionality relationship between fire applied and temperature increase, that's called the uh, heat capacity. We'll get to an equation of that. Um, but temperature is a way to uh, store energy. You know something about that because uh, uh, you can take, for example, hot rocks, get them hot during the day, and then during the night release that to, to heat the home. In fact, a big challenge uh, for renewable energy is uh, energy uh, storage, uh, meaning energy might be generated or during the day from wind and uh, solar, but needed at night. So, so what do you do with it? Well, there are different ways to think about how to store those jewels so they're available at an offset time later. Um, but one way to do it, uh, straightforward, is to actually just heat something, make it hot, and then get those jewels back later. So internal energy is, is right up there with other forms of energy that, that we've talked about. Now, along those lines, uh, there was a critical experiment in the 1840s that really connected these two types of energies, what we may call physics energies, meaning movement, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, electric energy, with what we might call thermal energy, meaning internal energy. Um, in the 1830s, there was no reason necessarily think that a moving object, uh, moving locomotive, 
um, has a certain kinetic energy to it. There's no reason to necessarily think that should be connected to something we get on a thermometer, meaning high temperature, low temperature. But in the 1840s, a very critical experiment was done, in fact, by the fellow whose name now goes to the energy unit, Joule. Um, what this fellow did was he took a paddle wheel, so he turned it in water. So this is the physics energy, so to speak, the rotation. And then he observed the temperature of the water and he saw that the temperature went up. Now, this may seem a trivial experiment. It was actually hard to do and the temperature didn't go up very much. But the scientist was able to establish that the energy, so to speak, that was lost from the rotation uh, showed up in the um, temperature of, of the water. And that was a way to then connect these two types of energy, movement, kinetic energy, physics energy, over to internal energy, uh, heat, temperature. And in some ways, that was the foundational observation for thermodynamics, to be able to make that connection that there was a oneness in different types of, uh, of energy. Thinking now about the connection of uh, energy to uh, temperature. So thinking now about uh, what we can call the internal energy, internal energy. Now you could use E internal, um, but it's actually more customary to use the symbol U for that, for internal energy. So U and E internal would be then uh, the, same, the same thing. Okay, so now the governing equation then for internal energy, or uh, U, is going to be, uh, it's going to be proportional to some uh, heat capacity of the substance um, times the, the mass of the substance times the uh, actual temperature that uh, you're at of interest difference to the reference temperature. So that's the, the change in internal energy, um, or it's the internal energy relative to uh, the reference uh, temperature. So if we take an example of that for uh, water, it uh, uh, has a CV, a heat capacity, heat capacity. Okay, it has a CV of 4.18, that's a property of the material, joules per gram uh, Kelvin. We're going to consider a liter of it. So one liter, uh, given the density of water, is 10 to 3 grams of water. And we're going to be interested in taking it from uh, room temperature. Uh, so our reference temperature, room temperature, 25 degrees Celsius or 298 uh, Kelvin. Uh, we're going to be interested in heating that to, by 10 degrees, so to 35 degrees uh, Celsius or 398 Kelvin. And how much internal energy then is gained by that liter of water in going from its reference temperature to 398? Well, we take 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin, and then we multiply by the mass, 10 to the 3 grams, so the grams cancel. And the difference in temperature, we're trying to get ourselves to uh, 308, small typo here, but uh, going up by 10 degrees, 308 minus 298, because we're asking the question, what's the increase in internal energy going from our reference temperature? And if we multiply all that out, we get 10 to the 4, we get 4.18, 10 to the 4 uh, joules which uh, if we turn that into kilojoules is 41.8 kilojoules. Um, so in some ways that water that's been warmed, we could call it an energy carrier. Um, it's uh, 10 degrees warmer than our reference of 298. And it's carrying, because of the temperature increase, it's carrying 41.8 kilojoules. That could then be, if the water were cooled somewhere else, that 41.8 kilojoules could be used for another purpose, whether that's electrical, mechanical, gravitational potential energy, internal energy. So that was the, the easy part of energy, things that we can experience, movement, velocity, high temperature, they're part of our everyday life. The cave person knew about it just as much as we knew about it. 
Um, that was the, the, the easy part, the tangible part, the, um, the thing that the, the observations that then drive the development, a formal sense of the discipline of thermodynamics. The hard part, well, energy is not something you can touch. It's abstract. We can touch mass, we can touch velocity, we can touch temperature, but we can't really touch energy. We can't put energy in a beaker and measure its volume. We can't put energy on a plate and measure its mass. Energy at the end of the day is a, a concept that we as humans have invented that helps us to explain the observations around us. Notice also that energy is an abstract concept. None of these energies has an absolute value. I always had to state a reference. So even for the moving car, I had to say, okay, I'm the observer. I define myself as zero velocity. And so the car is moving at 100 meters per second relative to me and has a mass. So the kinetic energy of the car is, or more, uh, more specifically, I could think of it as the, 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 the change in kinetic energy. Um, similarly, for the gravitational uh, potential height, I had to set a zero height. Uh, that could be ground level or that could be where I am. But then I was asking at 100 meters, where, uh, what is the gravitational potential energy at 100 meters relative to my reference? Um, uh, likewise, for temperature, for the internal energy, the internal energy didn't have an absolute value. I had to say, well, let me ask what is the internal energy, or more specifically, the change in internal energy relative to, and I chose room temperature or 298 Kelvin as my reference point. So all of these uh, concepts of energy uh, are, again, abstract because whenever I ask the question, what is the kinetic energy? What is the gravitational potential energy? What is the electric energy? What is the magnetic energy? What is the uh, internal energy? I'm always implicitly assuming or explicitly stating a reference condition for, uh, for uh, zero. Um, so I'm always having a, a relative change in energy. Again, that's another reason why energy is a, a hard, abstract concept, but nevertheless very useful. So in review, uh, energy, different types of energy uh, there is a as a, as a concept to unify what we see around us, mass and velocity, but then we have an equation that gives a certain amount of joules, which you call energy. Um, something up high, gravitational potential energy. But then we have an equation that gives us a certain amount of joules that corresponds to the mass and height of that object relative to our point of uh, uh, observation, meaning high above us. Um, temperature, meaning something that is at a, a higher temperature relative to us, has a higher uh, uh, internal energy than if it came down to the same temperature as uh, us. Now, the neat thing about having these equations then, of course, is conservation of energy. Joules are neither created nor destroyed. Um, there's some exception to that in uh, nuclear energy, where there's Einstein's famous equation of uh, E equals mc squared. But if one is not dealing with um, uh, nuclear changes, meaning uh, changes uh, interpersonal from mass and energy, if one's just dealing with straight up everyday experiences of uh, kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, magnetic energy, um, electric energy, um, internal energy, um, then we conserve joules. Uh, that's one of the fundamental uh, foundations of science, uh, law of conservation of, 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 of energy. And then with that as our human concepts and our equations for these different types of energy, then we're able to approach, rationalize, predict what's happening in the physical world around us. Acabou.